The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Today we're starting with um, an author, uh, Michael Ricker, who uh, has written a book, uh, The Mysterious Death of Kurt Cobain, A Suicide or Murder, You Decide. And he co-authored with uh, Tom Grant, who was the private investigator hired by Courtney Love at one time. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Alan, for having me. By the way, it's Matthew Ricker, not Michael. Oh, way. why did I say no that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Ah, well, there you go. Um, <laughs> Well, um, let's start out with, uh, how did you get involved in this? Um, was this something that you followed and were very interested in, or did you come across? I, I had written about uh, the death of Kurt Cobain years ago, and I'd gotten to know Tom. And um, there were a couple of books written about the story uh, before Tom had cooperated with a couple of authors. Uh, but they had never done a very good job. There were always, um, the other books uh, had some significant errors and um, chased a few false theories and uh, you know every every time the story got coverage it seemed to be one step forward and, and, and one step backward and I w had encouraged Tom to finally just write you know a book himself and that I would uh, cooperate with him and so what we did was Tom was the investigator and I was the author and we um, we uh, I decided to, to write the book based on, on Tom's uh, investigation. Tom still has a lot of evidence, a lot of, um, you know, he took very, very, very good notes. Uh, he recorded a lot of the conversations he had with people involved in this, in this case at the time. Uh, he acquired a lot of really good evidence. And during the research for this book, we actually found, uh, discovered a lot of new evidence. And um, we, I decided to write the book um, from from a first person perspective, from Tom's perspective, to take the reader behind the scenes of the investigation into Kirk Cobain's death, so they could understand what really happened. Now, knowing Tom as well as I do, I always knew what really happened, but it was very hard to, to translate that, uh, to convey that to the public, and uh, and that's 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 what we tried uh, we try to do in this book. That's pretty interesting. Did you find that uh, what uh, Tom had found and, and, and his evidence uh, was close to what you had thought it was originally? Um, it was actually um, Tom's evidence was actually a lot of his evidence uh, w when I found out everything that Tom had I, I realized that his case was even stronger than I, than I originally uh, believed and also um, uh, when when I dug into the case myself, when I, for example, when uh, I talked to members of the Seattle Police Department, and in this book we do we do um, uh, we do have some on the record conversations with uh, with some members of the Seattle Police Department that are very revealing, and um, uh, we don't use anything uh, we don't use any anonymous sources or anything like that in, in the book. So I was able to come up with a lot of new information that really strengthened the case for murder. Uh, in the book, and, and uh, we, we put that all there for the reader, and I think in a highly digestible form. Right. Yeah, no, it's a, a very good book. Um, uh, very well done. Uh, I, I, um, I have to say, um, I, I, so you, uh, well, where do I start? Um, <laughs> anyway, with, like? Yeah, well, with the um, police department itself, with Seattle Police Department, um, it's sort of not a, a, a very good commentary on them. Um, no. Now and you know and and Cameron and uh, who was the sergeant I believe um, uh, is this sort of like uh, has this ever really come to light in the public? Have these? Um, uh, I'm just I guess I'm kind of dancing around this. Uh, how do the police in Seattle react to this book and this kind of um, talk about them? Well, not very well. Uh, they, they are like a lot of institutions. They are very protective uh, of themselves. It, it is interesting. Now, the, the argument in favor of... Uh, let me just start here for the readers, or the listeners, rather. Uh, the, the argument that Kurt Cobain committed suicide is basically the argument from authority. That's really all the... Um, 
which is a log logical fallacy. It's really the only argument the Seattle Police Department uh, has made. Uh, in other words, we're the experts. We have determined that this is suicide and case closed. That's pretty much all they have said over the years. Uh, they keep asserting their expertise. Now, um, real arguments, of course, rely on evidence. If they had evidence to back this up, they could, of course, cite the evidence, but they never do that. Now, um, I have actually, um, um, uh, the Seattle media has not been very interested in this case, and uh, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, I did reach out to the current Seattle Police Chief, uh, Kathleen O'Toole. I have actually met her several times. Um, through, um, uh, we both went to Boston College. We have a lot of uh, friends in common. And um, I have actually uh, been in touch with her a, a little bit regarding the case. She is aware of the book, and she did say she would have one of her uh, detectives read it, but I don't know where it has gone from there. Um, so we have made a little bit of headway. She was actually an outside hire, uh, hired from, um, she had previously been the police chief in, in Boston, and she was hired uh, because of so many, uh, the Seattle Police Department has had so many problems with, uh, with corruption uh, and ineptitude. Uh, that's why she was brought in. So uh, there has been a little, a little bit of daylight um, uh, as far as getting the, the case reopened, but nothing official yet. Now, the, the Seattle Police Department, what they did was they ruled the case suicide. And we show this very clearly in the book. And this is very obvious from the, from the Seattle Police Department's uh, own reports from that day, which was April 8, 1994. They ruled the case um, a suicide at the crime scene and did not bother to investigate. Uh, Kirk Cobain's body was discovered on April 8th. The death certificate was signed by the medical examiner, King County Medical Examiner, on the following day, a Saturday, April 9th. So they pretty much ruled the case a suicide at the scene that day, despite some really glaring evidence. Uh, no interviews were conducted, um, no victimology, uh, no, no one interviewed the, uh, Kirk Cobain's uh, wife, Courtney Love, uh, no one interviewed um, any of the friends of uh, Kirk Cobain or associates, nothing like that was done. It was simply declared a suicide that day by the, by the medical examiner, as well as by the police department. And what do you what do you uh, uh, what what do you attain that to? Like, why why would they do that? Is is there something that they were? Are they trying to protect Courtney? Did they just not care? Were they sloppy? Like, what was the reasoning? You think? I think they were sloppy. I think uh, they just also did not care. I I think back then in the early nineties, you had all these grunge rock stars. Uh, appear in Seattle, and they became very wealthy, they became very influential, uh, they became um, a symbol of the city almost overnight, and there was a lot of resentment in Seattle uh, toward, uh, long, from longtime residents from the political establishment toward these people. These people were into heroin, and they, were, they dressed like slobs, and it was a, a lot of people thought it was a bad image for the city. So when Kurt Cobain uh, was found dead, a lot of people in Seattle simply didn't care. So uh, it was just uh, a mop-up. And we, just, we, we, we uh, describe this in the book where a former police officer in, in Seattle talks to Tom Grant and he says, well, what do you, what, what do you care, Tom? You know, it's, it's, those, those, those people, they're all just a bunch of junkies. It doesn't matter. And uh, that was pretty much the attitude that Tom Grant was uh, encountering uh, at that time. But... Uh, the, the Seattle Police Department, they, they, never, they never investigated the case. You've probably heard, now, the, the Kirk Cobain's body, for example, was released to the uh, funeral home the day after it was discovered. And, um, you know, weeks before the toxicology results were, were in, for example, the, the death certificate was signed and it was released, and he was cremated six days later. Now, when the body is cremated, the case is closed. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to understand that. Now, you've probably heard of, in, in, you know, in Alice in Wonderland, there was, um, <clears throat> the, I think it was the knave who was convicted of a crime, and then they have a show trial afterwards. Uh, in the case of Kurt Cobain, they, the, the body was cremated, and then once Tom Grant started raising some questions, which you see in the book, uh, uh, to uh, the detective in charge, uh, Detective uh, Sergeant Donald Cameron, 
Once he started raising questions, they sort of had a show investigation after the cremation. Uh, Kurt Cobain died on, uh, the body was discovered on April 8th, but the suicide note wasn't uh, analyzed until the 22nd of April. And then uh, over the course of May, they decided to check the shotgun for finger fingerprints. They decided to check the shotgun shell for fingerprints. All this was done after the fact only because Tom started asking questions. They just sort of had this show investigation. Now, the shotgun, for example, was nearly four feet long. And uh, it had a large surface over area over onto which one could uh, leave prints. And it had been handled by at least three people before uh, Kurt Cobain um, had died. And there were no fingerprints found on that shotgun, which is unusual because it's a very big weapon. And... Um, that suggests that the shotgun had been wiped down. Now, if they had tested the shotgun uh, before they had closed the case, you know, maybe they could have uh, um, uh, acted differently. But when police officers close a case, you know, and they don't like to be told that they've made a mistake. They don't like to be, especially by a private investigator from Beverly Hills. Uh, they, police officers have big egos. That's not a secret. And when Tom started pointing out discrepancies in the uh, in the verdict, they started digging their heels in, and they've been digging them in ever since. Yeah, yeah and that's that's pretty typical, too. I mean, they, they feel challenged, you know. Uh, I found that another thing was, I, I didn't realize, now the autopsy report was never released to the public, was it? No. No, to this day, it has not been released to the public. Uh, and is, and uh, it, is that standard practice now? I mean, in no, the, just uh, in the state of Washington, because autopsy reports are considered uh, private medical records in the state of Washington. So only the next of kin can release that report. So Courtney Love could order that report and release it and make it public if she wanted to, but she's not about to do that. So it stayed. Uh, it has. Um, it stayed under wraps since 1994. Uh, but I guess the police would have access to it if they wanted. The police could have access to it, but they can't make it public. Now, Kurt Cobain was found, of course, we do know that the, um, some, of the toxic, some of the toxicology results did leak uh, in the press, um, uh, you know, after the body was discovered. Um, you know, only about a week later, some of the, the drug results uh, were, were leaked to the press, and According to the Seattle Post Intelligencer, um, which, and this was later confirmed by the Seattle Police Department, um, Kurt Cobain had 1.52 milligrams of heroin in his system when he died. Now that is uh, 1.52 milligrams post mortem is more than three times the lethal dose of heroin. Uh, that he he would have had to have injected a minimum of 225 milligrams of heroin into his veins before he died. This was a guy who was only five foot seven, 120 pounds. So he took an enormous dose of heroin. He should have been found with the needle still in his arm. This needle, this this level of heroin would have incapacitated him within seconds. But instead, we're told that he actually he inject and Kurt Cobain was found with two separate injection points. This has been confirmed. They have confirmed some details of the autopsy, even though they haven't released the, the full autopsy report. And um, according to Detective Mike Szynski of the Seattle Police Department, um, uh, Kurt Cobain was found with two separate injection points, one in each elbow. Uh, and so he injected himself twice, and then he replaced the safety tips onto the syringes. This is also w w what uh, Detective confirmed uh, inexplicably. And he, he replaced the safety tips on the syringes, so instead of, you know, you know, passing out with the needle still in his arm, as he should have. He replaced the safety tips on the, on the syringes, neatly put away the drug tip, uh, drug kit, rolled down his sleeves, and then picked up a shotgun, a four-foot-long shotgun, even though he was not a, a, a big guy and he, he did not have long arms, he picked up this four-foot shotgun and stuck it into his mouth and pulled the trigger. Now, that is virtually impossible to do. We talked to several uh, prominent medical examiners, and they cannot figure out how this could have possibly happened. He should have been incapacitated with sec within seconds. There's also the problem of, of the nature of heroin, and we discussed this as well in the book. Um, there are virtually no cases of someone uh, injecting heroin just before committing uh, a violent act of suicide. We can't find a single case of this ever happening before. 
Uh, remember, uh, when someone injects heroin, they experience something called the rush. It's this intense euphoria that happens within several seconds of the injection, and it lasts for several minutes. And uh, it's, it's this in, in, incredible, uh, addicts describe it as a sexual orgasm that filters throughout the entire body. And that was the experience to which people like Kurt Cobain were so very addicted. So we're also supposed to believe that he injected this heroin, and just before this rush begins, just before it commences, he immediately picks up a shotgun and sticks into his mouth and pulls the trigger. There's a major contradiction there. And that's just a question the, the medical examiner in Seattle uh, and never bothered to ask, and the, and the Seattle police never bothered to ask. Wow. Uh, um, so w what's your theory? Then someone else had, had um, injected the heroin into him? Well, so, someone else injected the heroin. Now, in, in stage suicides, now the problem with, the problem with investigating, um, the problem with uh, suicide is you don't really have to, now police, of course, have to prove murder, but you don't really have to prove suicide. That's the danger of suicide investigation. Um, uh, you have to prove more murder to, you know, a jury, to a court, uh, to a district attorney. Uh, but suicide, you don't have to, to prove suicide, you don't really have to do any of that. If the police rule a case of suicide, they can just scribble a suicide and a cause of death and, and move on. Now, um, in, in, a, in a murder that is staged to look like a suicide, almost any wound committed uh, uh, in, uh, that one uh, experiences in a suicide can be replicated in a murder. So, um, in a, in a s murders that are staged look like suicide, the victim is usually stupefied beforehand. Um, sometimes with um, um, drugs or alcohol or some combination thereof. So we think that Kurt Cobain probably um, knew the people who, who were in the room when he died and uh, who killed him. And they, he agreed to do heroin with him, and at some point he was injected with more heroin than he wanted to be injected with. And once this heroin, this enormous dose of heroin, uh, put him out cold, someone simply inserted a shotgun into his mouth and pulled the trigger. Now, now the reason this theory is, um, another reason why this theory uh, holds a lot of weight is because um, their ejection port, on the shotgun used to kill Kurt Cobain. Now, the shotgun used to kill Kurt Cobain was a home defense shotgun, uh, a Remington uh, 20 gauge. And it's a light load shotgun. It's, the purpose of the shotgun is really to, um, to scare off intruders. If you, could, if you shot it into the wall of your home, it wouldn't penetrate the wall and, and, and hit someone in the room next door. So, um, uh, now, this shotgun has an ejection port on the right side of the shotgun. Now, the shotgun was found in Kurt Cobain's hands uh, inverted, lying across his chest. So the, sh the ejection port was facing Kurt Cobain's right. However, the spent shotgun shell uh, used to, to kill Kurt Cobain, that spent shotgun shell was found lying on Kurt Cobain's left. Now, there's no way that shotgun shell could have ejected uh, from that ejection point and landed to the left. Something happened there, but the police missed that detail because, because they arrived at the scene assuming it was a suicide and just, just overlooked it. They did record it in their report, however. Hmm. So, now, uh, when, you, when you come right down to this, um, uh, you, you, you guys are basically saying that Courtney Love was behind it. We believe she was behind it. She wasn't there when he died, but we we believe she was behind it. She certainly benefited from it. Right. And so you think that's the main reason. Like, a, a lot of uh, the book talks about their fighting and their... Um, uh, and back and forth, and, and, and also about divorce, possibly, and... Uh, mm -hmm. um, I, and also about their their child and and who would who would have custody and things like that. Is that the primary reason you think? Well, the primary reason was um, uh, we we discuss Courtney Love's. Uh, we give a, a biography of her in the book, 
and we discuss her. At, we describe her as a uh, sociopath, right. which is um, what her own mother believes, her own grandmother believes, her friends and relatives, you know, people who know her best, certainly believe that. Um, some will call her a psychopath, but we use the term sociopath. A sociopath, like a psychopath, is someone who has um, no human conscience at all. They have no uh, feelings of uh, genuine affection or guilt toward, uh, uh, over anything they do. They have no affection for any human beings. They have no empathy for other human beings or animals. And um, we even um, uh, just talk about this in the book. Uh, uh, psychiatrists have actually, medical researchers have discovered there's an empathy circuit in the brain where um, it's, it's in sociopaths, um, uh, in normal human beings, this, this empathy circuit will, will light up um, during um, you know, normal human interaction. But in sociopaths, this circuit in the brain is simply switched off at birth. Uh, they simply can't help it. They don't feel any human empathy for other human beings. And, and Courtney Love has always been like this, even since she was a toddler. Uh, she's just a profoundly disturbed person. She was committed to a mental health treatment center when she was a, a teenager. She was sent to a form school when she was a teenager. She has a, a, quite a history of violence and drugs and crime uh, since she was a little girl. You know, just uh, um, you, you can't help feeling sorry for her, really, when you, when you read about her. Yeah. Now, um, her lifelong uh, goal, however, was to be a rock star. But she didn't have any talent. She didn't quite have the looks to be a rock star either. So she had married Kurt Cobain. She had targeted Kurt Cobain and because she believed Kurt Cobain was going, some, going places and that he could be a useful springboard for her in order to become a rock star. However, she had an album coming out that Kurt Cobain uh, wrote com and composed uh, called Live Through Risk, and it was coming out um, in April of 1994, and it was going to be accompanied by two, at least two very, very devastating revelations. One, Nirvana was breaking up, and a big reason why they were breaking up is Courtney Love. No one in the band could stand her. Uh, Kurt Cobain was divorcing Courtney Love. Uh, he had asked his attorney, Rosemary Carroll, uh, uh, to hire a divorce attorney, and he also... Uh, um, asked Rosemary Carroll to have his will uh, changed so that Courtney would re not, not receive any money. Uh, now, uh, and a third reason probably was going to be when her album came out, it was, was going to be accompanied by those revelations and possibly the revelation that she didn't actually write the album herself. Uh, so uh, there was a lot on the line in April. She needed Kurt Cobain's money. She needed his... Um, she needed his, that association with him in order to have success, and she was about to lose it all. So, and she was on the verge of 30, too, which is very old for an aspiring female rock star. So that was, that was th those are part of the motives for, for um, uh, the combination there, Rob, were part of the motives for killing Kurt Cobain. Now, uh, you have to realize, we describe this in the book, uh, Courtney Love had acquired complete control over Kurt Cobain's finances. She took private jets, she took limousines, she, she lived very large, and she had all, it was all his money, but she had control over all of it. And she was not about to give that up. And now if they had a prenuptial agreement that Kurt's management made him sign. So if uh, Kurt Cobain were to divorce her, she would not only lose her career, she, would not have, she, she wasn't going to get any money. So um, there was a lot at stake for her. So there, there, you know, money is a is a, uh, is the oldest motive in the book. Uh, how do you feel about the uh, movie that came out following um, called Kurt and Courtney uh, by Nick Broomfield? Um, uh, did you ever see that? I did. Yeah, I, I you know I've never met Nick Broomfield. Um, I thought it was, um, you know, it was like I uh, said to one of the reasons. Tom and I decided to cooperate on this book. It was, you know, one step forward and, and probably uh, two steps backward. I thought the the film was um, very poor in a lot of ways, uh, and gave a, you know represented the facts of the case very poorly. Yet most people who see the film come away convincing that Kurt Cobain was murdered. So um, you know you can't knock it entirely. So how has Courtney? reacted to all of this and, and to Tom himself? Is she kind of, um, is she threatened to sue him now? Is she, uh, 
What's no, that? Courtney uh, threatened to sue Tom uh, initially when they were, and this is described in the book, when he first started to speak out. Tom wrestled with the case, and I, I want to describe the, uh, I want to describe this process in the book, and readers will see this. The, the struggle for Tom Grant was to the struggle of coming out and blowing the whistle. Uh, Tom is a whistleblower. Uh, his detractive has. Detractors have called him a conspiracy theorist, but that is not true, because um, a, conspira a conspiracy theorist is someone like uh, someone who is outside the story, who has an opinion on it. So, for example, you and I could sit here and talk about the JFK assassination, but you and I weren't there, uh, and the, you know that conversation may be you know maybe um, it may be accurate, it may not be accurate, but um, Tom, uh, however, was there. He was in the middle of the events. He was hired by Courtney Love, you know, just days before Kurt Cobain's body was discovered. He was in the middle, the midst. Of we at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C, it's truly criminal. Of the investigation the entire time and he was documenting everything that happened. And then he struggled at a certain point to blow the whistle. And the reason he... Um, he finally uh, blew the whistle. He wanted. He didn't want to blow the whistle until he was 100% sure that Kurt Cobain was murdered. And what happened was Courtney started to really, really change her story. Um, and if you listen to the recordings, and some of them are available at Tom's website, um, CobainCase.com, the, the audio recordings between Kurt and Courtney, I think I emailed you a few of them too. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you listen to them, in the fall of 1994, Tom becomes, you know, slightly more confrontational with Courtney, and Courtney becomes, you know, increasingly fearful. And then at a certain point in um, November, Rolling Stone published a, um, an interview with Courtney where she claims that Kurt Cobain had written her a suicide note, and a another suicide note, a third suicide note, um, in which uh, he, you know, talked about his, you know, desire for death. But Tom had never seen this suicide note. He had never heard of this suicide note. And Courtney had never shown it to anyone, including the Seattle police. So Tom knew that she was lying then, and that is when he decided to speak out publicly uh, about what he had, uh, what he had learned. And and I have to say one thing now. Uh, the um the uh, scenario of, of it talks a lot about um, his relationship with Courtney, and um, in the book now there's suggestions that um, the, the, the the typical uh, story about him having um, having to be in um, trying to kill himself before, you know, locking himself in the in the room right. and, and trying to do that um, and uh, overdosing and all that was not real. Um, it was not. Yeah. So, so they were kind of done to uh, for PR, I guess. Right. It, it's uh, I call it framing the narrative, which is you have to re remember now that in the press in 1994, there wasn't much of an online media in 1994. So, the press moved much slower then. There wasn't much of an alternative media. There wasn't really any alternative media to speak of. So you really had to rely on the uh, mainstream uh, newspapers and magazine, print magazines and television. Media just moved very slowly then, and it was uh, very easy for her to manipulate it. And I call it framing the narrative. And 
And she did this before Kurt Cobain uh, uh, was killed and, and, and after the fact. Now, in, uh, we describe this uh, as the, in, um, in the Rome, the alleged Rome overdose. Now, Kurt, in March of 1994, uh, had called uh, his attorney, Rosemary Carroll, uh, and we know this because Rosemary Carroll discussed it at length with Tom, um, had called from Germany. Uh, actually, there were a number of other people in the room with Kurt Cobain when he made this phone call. And he called Courtney from, and his attorney, Rosemary Carroll, from Germany and uh, demanded a divorce. And um, <clears throat> when Fran and when Courtney flew uh, a few days later to to with the baby Francis uh, to meet Kurt in uh, Rome, they had already agreed uh, they had already agreed to get a divorce. And Kurt had met with her in the hotel room and written a note, a three-page note uh, we refer to as the Rome note, and describing their reason, the reasons why he wanted a divorce her. Uh, one of them being her ongoing affair with Billy Corgan. Now, uh, <clears throat> the next day, Kurt Cobain was rushed to the hospital. Uh, according to Courtney, she woke up at about 3 in the morning and uh, discovered Kurt Cobain uh, lying, you know. She's told different versions of what happened. But at about 3 in the morning, she, according to her, she discovered that Kurt Cobain had overdosed. And um, she, had called, she waited three hours, according to her, to call, at least three hours to call the ambulance and Kurt Cobain was rushed to the hospital. Now at that time, uh, she believed Kurt Cobain was dead. And we describe this in the book in, in detail. Um, Kurt Cobain got to the hospital. From, from her hotel room, we believe, Courtney had called uh, David Geffen of Geffen Records, the most powerful man in the music industry, called him at his office, this is according to David Geffen, and told him, that Kurt Cobain had committed suicide. She told him that Kurt Cobain was congenitally suicidal and that he had finally, finally gone through with it. That's pretty much the talking point she has always stuck to. Kurt Cobain was congenitally suicidal and, you know, this time he had finally gone through with it. She was the only person who ever believed that. But nevertheless, that was the talking point she repeated over and over again. And she told David Geffen that day, she called him at his office. Now, David Geffen... Uh, called Nirvana's manager, Danny Goldberg, and told him what um, Courtney had said. And Danny Goldberg uh, did a little research, and he called back and said that the, told David Geffen that the phone call was a hoax. Now, that's, I think, very hard to believe. I don't think it is very difficult to get David Geffen on the phone. I simply wouldn't know how to do it. Um, so we believe... Uh, David Geffen was right the first time. We believe Courtney Love really did call him and have that con conversation with him. And she told him from Rome that Kurt Cobain had committed suicide. But, um, but uh, Kurt Cobain, in fact, in fact uh, was in a 20-hour coma, but he did come out of that coma and he did survive. Um, and at the time, everyone involved, including the doctors, said that it was an accidental overdose. But... Uh, what he overdosed on was a mixture of champagne and rohypnol. And as we describe in, this, in the book, and Courtney admits it herself, that rohypnol um, actually, which is well known as the date rape drug, the rohypnol prescription actually belonged to Courtney. It did not belong to Kurt. So we think that Courtney slipped him some champagne and some ro rohypnol in Rome, and, it, and that was the first attempt on his life, but he survived it. But when he returned to the, to the States, he was, you know, he had probably blacked out about the entire event that happened, but he did not forget his intent to divorce Courtney. And when he returned to the, uh, to the States, he told his attorney, Rosemary Carroll, that he wanted to change his will. So uh, he was back a couple of weeks in March. And this is, I think, probably my favorite section of the book. And this is the March 18th incident. On March 18th, uh, Courtney had dialed 911 and told officers, the Seattle police officers, that Kurt Cobain had locked himself in a room with a gun and was threatening suicide. Now this event, after, this did not make the press when it happened. It only made the press after Kurt Cobain's body was discovered weeks later, uh, in, you know, dead in the greenhouse above his garage. And this was, 
this event and the March 18th incident was widely reported in the media, made a cover story and the basis for a cover story in Newsweek. Um, but when we, when I looked into the, uh, the facts of the March 18th incident, it turned out to be completely false. I got the police report and I also spoke on the record to the detective that arrived on the scene that day. Uh, who's still in the Seattle Police Force. He was a patrol officer then. His name is Everett Edwards. He is now a detective. Now, he told me that when he arrived at the scene that day, he found Courtney Love standing in a nightgown, screaming wildly on the porch. And he said, oh, Kurt Cobain, you know, Kurt's upstairs. He has a gun. He's going to kill himself. And uh, But when he went to, some officers went, entered the house through the front door, and Everett Edwards and his partner, they went to the back door, and they were expecting to find someone locked in the house with a gun threatening suicide. Instead, they found Kurt Cobain standing in the backyard with his hands in his pockets. No gun, just looked deeply embarrassed, deeply annoyed, and whenever Everett Edwards approached him, uh, Kurt Cobain just apologized and sorry, you know, you know, my wife, there she goes again. And uh, Kurt Cobain told them, you know, I didn't, I, don't have, I didn't have a gun, I wasn't threatening suicide, I, you know, I, wasn't, um, um, I didn't say I was going to hurt myself, I just got in a fight with my wife and I locked myself in the bedroom. So um, they sat down, they talked to him, Kurt Cobain wasn't on the influence, he didn't seem suicidal, he just seemed very embarrassed and very apologetic. Now when the officers interviewed Courtney Love, she actually admitted to them that she'd made the entire story up that she had never seen Kurt Cobain with a gun and that she had never heard him uh, say he was going to hurt himself. So there we have, on the record from the Seattle Police Department, uh, Courtney Love inventing an entire suicide attempt by Kurt Cobain just before he actually dies. Wow. So, so yeah. she, she was kind of setting up the... Uh... She was setting up. She was framing the narrative, as we, we, I call it in the book. She was framing the suicide narrative. Right. And so when... when um, just before Kirk, now after that March 18th incident, when that, or rather on that day, the police actually went in, because that's protocol during domestic violence, uh, 911 calls, to confiscate any guns or medication they could find, which they did. And so Kirk Cobain went out, he was afraid that um, uh, he, he, he didn't have much of a security system at the home, he didn't have any bodyguards. He had had a lot of um, strange groupies showing up at the house and knocking on the front door looking for him and things like that. So he had some real security concerns. So he asked, after that, he asked his best friend, Dylan Carlson, to purchase a shotgun for him in his name because he was afraid of, uh, there'd be another 911 call, the police might come, and they'd confiscate another uh, shotgun. So, um, so that is when he bought the shotgun. Now, um, and, and that was simply a home protection shotgun. But Courtney didn't sell it that way. Now, uh, shortly after that, Kurt Cobain decides to attend uh, drug rehab in Los Angeles. He buys the gun, and I believe he flies out uh, with Dylan Carlson, his best friend, and I believe he flies to Los Angeles that night to attend drug rehab. And he stays for just a few days and then flies back. Now... <clears throat> He arrives uh, right around midnight. Uh, he, return, he flies back to Seattle on around midnight, um, April 1st. Now, according to the police report, Courtney filed on Monday morning, April 4th. This is just after she hired, uh, one day after she hired Tom Grant. The police report Courtney filed from Los Angeles, a missing person report, I should call it, I'm sorry, um, she files this missing person report, but it's a false report. She files it in her mother-in-law's name, her mother, Kurt's mother, Wendy O'Connor, a woman uh, that Kurt had very, very little contact with. He had a very poor relationship with his mother. But Courtney filed the missing person report in, in Kurt's mother's name. Um, she didn't want to file it in her own name, and I, we think that the reason she did that is because she wanted to be able to report, word the report. The report reads, and I'll read it to you, Mr. Cobain ran away from California facility and flew back to Seattle. He also bought a shotgun and may be suicidal. Mr. Cobain may be at a redacted location for narcotics. Now, so the, the story that Courtney framed was that he fled 
from a California re drug rehab facility, then bought the shotgun and was intending suicide. But that's not true. The facility he was staying in uh, in Los Angeles was, you know, he was free to come and go whenever he wanted. It wasn't a lockdown facility. He didn't have to run away from it. And he purchased the shotgun before he flew to Los Angeles, not when he got, not when he returned. So basically, what we're, what uh, you know, what the Seattle police are saying now is that Kurt Cobain bought this shotgun for the purpose of committing suicide, but then said, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to buy this shotgun for su in order to commit suicide, but I think I'm going to fly down to Los Angeles to kick my drug habit first. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But again, Courtney had framed framed the death of Kurt Cobain with this missing person report, and the police simply never questioned it. And, of course, why would they? His own mother said so. He must be suicidal if his mother said so, but his mother never, never said so. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it just, I think that was sort of the, um, the consequential pebble that started the whole avalanche of Kurt Cobain committed suicide. Yeah. And, and you know, was there a suicide note or not? There was a suicide note. Now, this is interesting. Um, there was a suicide note found at the scene. It was written in red ink in, on the back of an IHOP menu. Now, uh, the note, uh, which anyone can find online, the note was actually made public by Tom Grant. Uh, it was not made public by Courtney Love. Now, the note, uh, excerpts of the note had been appearing uh, in the press, um, these very suicidal-sounding excerpts of the note. But Tom actually, we describe this in the book, he actually tricked Courtney into giving him a copy of the note, allowing him to make a photocopy of the note. And we, he discovered is the note actually never mentioned suicide, and it actually reads just like, just as a, a retirement letter to uh, Nirvana fans about the breakup of Nirvana. It never mentioned suicide. It's written, uh, he doesn't even mention uh, Courtney or his daughter, uh, except in the third person. And then he signs the note, um, you know, with his full name, Kurt Cobain. A lot of people don't, I don't think too many people sign suicide notes with their full name. But there is also a suspicious postscript. And anyone can see this if you Google this. The postscript to the suicide note is written uh, in a different hand uh, with a different pen. And the postscript mentions, court, and it's the only the postscript, is, is the only place where Courtney and the daughter, Frances, uh, are mentioned. And so it's, um, it's a very suspicious suicide note, and it doesn't make any sense, but um, Tom uh, decided to make it public uh, went after he went public uh, the following year. Now, according to Courtney, at that time, she, she gave a suicide note, uh, or rather the, the note that Kurt Cobain, which you mentioned earlier in Rome, what we call the Rome note, she gave that Rome note to the uh, Seattle police uh, for a comparison writing sample. However, on I think it was June the 17th of 1994, the detective uh, in charge of the investigation, Donald Cameron, he personally drove to Courtney Love's home and returned that Rome note to her and told her, I would get rid of this note if I were you. I would destroy it immediately because it's not going to do you any good. That is according to Courtney Love herself. Credit card was another uh, issue. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what was the significance of, of the credit card being used? Well, when, when, when Tom was first hired, he was hired on Easter Sunday, um, Courtney found his ad in the Yellow Pages uh, in Los Angeles, and um, she was staying at the Beverly Hills Peninsula Hotel. And she called him and she said, I need to find out who's using my husband's stolen credit card. And when he arrived at the hotel, or hotel, her hotel suite that day, she actually admitted to him that she had canceled the credit card, that she had lied, that, oh, you know, my husband's credit card wasn't stolen, I simply just canceled it. And she canceled his, you know, his ATM card, all of his cards were canceled. Now, by Courtney Love, because she had con complete control over the finances. And the reason she did that is because she did not want, she didn't know where Kurt Cobain was, and she did not want him to leave Seattle. If he left Seattle alive that weekend, uh, he would probably follow through in his plans to divorce her, and that would have been devastating to her career. Her, her, her album was coming out in about another 10 days. So, the, but after canceling the credit card, uh, Tom had um, um, 
gotten the information, gotten um, the credit card information from the, the bank, which was C First Bank, and he started tracking the credit card activity. And the credit card, we, we believe Kurt Cobain was probably killed on Sunday evening, late Sunday evening, April 3rd, or early morning, morning uh, Monday, April 4th. But the credit card, uh, there were attempted transactions on the credit card all week long. Uh, to withdraw money, uh, mostly to withdraw money. And there were two uh, transaction attempts on Friday, April 8th, the day the body was discovered. Two transactions. However, that card was never found, and the transaction attempts stopped as soon as the body was discovered. Now, this was evidence the Seattle police did not think was, for whatever reason, did not think was important, even though Tom Grant had faxed, uh, faxed all the information over to them. They simply never looked at him. I, uh, wow. <clears throat> Not picking on the police, but up again was uh, uh, the thing about him being barricaded in the in the room. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's not true, is it? No, it's not at all. Now, we spoke to, on the record, the, uh, the when the body was discovered, um, we... Um, the, there was, the fire department came and forced entry into the greenhouse above the garage where the body was. And, and the fireman who forced entry was a, a, fire, a now lieutenant, John Fisk. And he, op he forced open, uh, he broke a pane of glass and opened the door. And the door was just a simple door with a push and twist lock like you find on a bathroom door. And he forced open that door and he told us there was nothing in front of that door. There was no stool or anything. It was very easy to enter into the greenhouse. Now, the police reports, uh, there are two s sets of police reports. In one set, in one of the reports, they mention the fact that there is a, garden, a small gardening stool in the greenhouse, on the offset of the greenhouse. But in another, uh, there is a sort of an addendum on the, to the police reports, which says there was a gardening stool put, pressed up against the greenhouse doors that was preventing access. You know, that Kurt Cobain had wedged the stool up against the doors, and therefore he must have been alone inside the greenhouse when he died. But the firemen told us that that's not true, that, that there, there was no stool there. So that's another, you know, there's a, just a blatant lie that we caught the Seattle police in. Uh, but they, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to uh, call them on it when they won't acknowledge it. Yeah, and another one was the, uh, what, what's this about the driver's license, too, which was... Well, the driver's license is that when the... When the um, when they walked in, the, the first officer on the scene, he's a lieutenant now, uh, one Lewandowski, and then the, a couple of us, they, the, 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 his wallet was on the floor, and they, they pulled out his wallet, and they pulled out his, um, his uh, driver's license on the wallet, and then they put it on top of the wallet and took a photograph. Now, just so they could, just for identification purposes. Now, uh, the story got out in the press that Kurt Cobain had done that himself in order to help the investigators identify the body. Uh, Courtney Love has always promoted a very gruesome depiction of Kurt Cobain's death. She always claimed there was lots of blood at the scene, and there was blood everywhere, and there was blood all over his jacket, and that she used to wear the jacket around that was covered with blood. None of that was true. There was very little blood at the scene, actually. And uh, his face was instantly recognizable. There was very little damage to the face because it was a minimum impact shotgun. Um, uh, one of the rumors that went around at the time was that the damage to his face was so severe that the body had to be identified with fingerprints. But that's not true. They actually, medical examiners fingerprint everybody regardless of the condition of it. Uh, but the truth is there was very little um, damage to the body. That was just sort of an urban legend that went around about the uh, driver's license. Wow. Uh, so, so she was sort of setting up uh, a scenario and, and, and being the grieving spouse. And, and, right, and right. You have to, and we talk about this in the book. Now, a genuine suicide is a very difficult, a suicide survivor is a very difficult you know, position to be in. Uh, suicide is, to be a suicide survivor is a literal hell on earth for people. But it wasn't for her. The day Kurt Cobain's body was discovered, she was on the phone uh, for hours uh, calling reporters and uh, arranging for reporters to come to the house. Uh, the next day, she called MTV, gave an uh, interview at length, and every day afterwards, she was constantly on the phone with the press. She even gave Tom Grant's cell phone number uh, out to members of the press so he, he, they could get a quote from him. Uh, she was con Courtney apparently spends, uh, I'm told she spends between 8 to 12 hours on the phone every day. 
So even the day he died, in the days afterwards, she was constantly on the phone calling, um, calling reporters. Uh, in fact, Tom, we have evidence. Um, we refer to this in the book, uh, the as the pen pal letter. Uh, when Tom Graham made a copy of the suicide note, uh, he found another note uh, next to Courtney's copy machine, where she was um, sending faxes to. Um, uh, music writers in Great Britain trying to get them to positively review her album that was uh, coming out. So she <laughs> she just never quit. She was constantly uh, she was going to milk this uh, the death of Kurt Cobain for for everything she could. So where do you see yourself going now? Like what what's the plans for uh, Matthew now? Well, we we would like to try to. Um, we, we would like to try to, um, the book has gotten a lot of interest. We would like to try to, uh, we're, and, you know, we're talking to people about um, having a, um, a print copy of the book. Uh, we've had interest from people who, who wanted to make a film out of the book. We'll see where that goes. But the biggest thing we would like to achieve is we would like to, um, we would like to have the case reopened. Um, we had some, we've had some interest from the Seattle Police Chief, Kathleen O'Toole, uh, and uh, we hope she follows through on that. And, um, you know, I think that they're realizing that this is not going away. And um, uh, it's, it's, you know, you just can't uh, sit on it anymore. You can't engage in denial anymore. Uh, someone has to reinvestigate this case once and for all. Any interest or comments come from Frances Bean, their daughter? No, uh, we have not. We, as far as we know, we have had some interest from um, Francis Bean's uh, husband, um, um, who's soon to be ex-husband, uh, yeah. and uh, he, he's of the opinion that Kurt Cobain was murdered. And um, but um, you know, we've we've um, we have um, we have had people close to Courtney Love uh, come forward and tell us that. Um, uh, that Kurt, you know, Kurt Cobain's mother is having second thoughts, and uh, some of Courtney's friends now believe he was murdered, and they're, you know, talking about coming forward, but you know, they they haven't quite yet. Now uh, we've had a lot of off the record, interesting off the record conversations, but getting people to to go on the record uh, has been a bit more of a challenge. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And Courtney's a pretty aggressive person, so I wouldn't want to. She is. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go up against her in that sort of a scenario, you know. So I, you know, I see why certain friends or people wouldn't want to be public, you know. Um, a certainly interesting read. I, I, I didn't realize there were so many um, things I learned in reading the book, and I recommend everybody to read it. It's uh, the mysterious death of Kurt Cobain. Suicide or murder, you decide. And, of course, the uh, author was Tom Grant and Matthew Ricker. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to talk about your book on the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> The end. By George, he's got it. It is the end. I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi there, I'm Kendra Adachi. And I host the Lazy Genius Podcast, a show that helps you be a genius about the things that matter and lazy about the things that don't. But here's the kicker. You get to decide what matters, not me. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to give you a new way to see. Episodes are around 20 minutes and are full of practical, helpful information, as well as a lot of permission slips to do what makes sense for you. New episodes drop every Monday and cover a broad range of topics from laundry and getting dinner on the table to finding work-life balance and organizing your inbox. So I invite you to give the Lazy Genius Podcast a listen. Together, let's stop doing it all for the sake of doing what matters. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. 
You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.